our day and age too, right? Well, oh, so and so before he died, he got right with God. He got he got things settled between God. And we put this kind of this weird understanding that getting right with God is on us, right? That it's some burden we get to carry and figure out along the way. And, and no doubt this young man who's got the riches still recognizes that there's something not quite complete about it. Or otherwise he wouldn't have bothered coming to Jesus and asking because he had it all. Great wealth. And in fact, when Jesus even says, he says, first of all, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Perhaps he was trying to reveal to the crowd a little bit more about who he really was. Perhaps he was just trying to remind the rich young man that, uh, you know, you're, you're asking an interesting question here. And you're, you're, your question is really needs to be directed to God. We're not sure, but only God alone is good. Which, first of all, should have been maybe a tip-off for the rich young man, too, right? Because really the question is, how good do I need to be? Right? Do you hear kind of, maybe I'm adding sarcasm because that's unfortunately my, my cutting edge in my life. My, my, my edge that God's working on taking off, right? But I hear a question like that. What, what do I need to do to be good enough? And what's that really asking? It's kind of really asking, what's the minimum? What's the minimum requirement? Right? You know, it's not about how can I go above and beyond. It's, you know, what, what's really required here? It is interesting he uses the word to inherit eternal life. Maybe he had a, a, a progressive understanding of God's grace and that it's something that's given and bestowed upon us by, by God. I'm not sure. Paul will later clarify this for us in his letters to the, to the church in Romans uh, chapter 8 and in um, uh, Colossians chapter 1. He makes the point that the inheritance we have from God, we've only been qualified, we're only qualified for it because of what Christ has done for us. Not by what we have done to earn it. Right? If we're, if we're, if we're, how many of you are, are Lutherans pretty far back in the family tree? Right? So we kind of know this stuff in our head, or we, we, we've been taught, taught it at some point, right? It's not about me, it's about God. I'm not God, which should come as a relief, I hope, for most of us. And yet some of us, like the rich young ruler, think we've got to have life all figured out and all the details planned and, and determined and the formula in place so that I can continue to carry on this life that will eventually lead me to this great inheritance of eternal life. It will require a death. It will require a, an incredible, costly death. Jesus himself would have to die. But apparently, too, the rich young man is going to need to encounter or face the prospect of a death as well. And so Jesus says, well, you know the commands. And he clips off the five or so or six of the commands that have primarily to do with the relationship between people, right? He says, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud, honor your father and mother. Now, if, just out of curiosity, if you were presented with that as the standard that you have to be measured by, how many of you would make it? You've never murdered. And remember, Jesus goes on to say, it's not just about murder, it's about being hate-filled toward another person unjustly, ever. I've uh, never stolen, but if we've ever cheated or misrepresented or tweaked some information, I had a good friend back in, in uh, California who said, storying. We're good at storying about a situation, right? Adding, embellishing a few things. If I've ever told a lie ever in my life, right? says, if you've never, you know, did not commit adultery. Jesus says, I say, if you even look upon another with lust in your heart, you're guilty, right? The list goes on. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie. You shall not gossip. Honor your father and mother. How many of you know a child like that, that is continually and always? <laughs> Honor, there's, there's a couple in the room. Yeah, they're very humble, but they do. <laughs> and so Jesus is confronting the man with some basic instructions and the man in his whether it's ignorance or arrogance we're not sure but he says well teacher I've, I've kept all those since my youth wow pretty impressive right he's got a pretty good uh, pretty good resume then to come before Jesus with but Jesus it says looks at the man and here's, here's, the, here's the game changer right he looks at the man and it says he has love for the man. He has compassion. There's something about this man that Jesus likes. And that's true for you too, by the way. In all our 
pride, all our arrogance, and all our puffing up, all our thinking that we've got it under control, all those things that, that, that we may even, if we're really honest with ourselves, kind of, you know, think less about ourselves or, or, or beat ourselves up with, you know, sometimes we're our worst bully, right? Yeah. 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 About our lives. But when Jesus looks at us, he has compassion toward us. He has a heart toward us. His heart leans out. That word compassion is it reaches, it extends beyond himself to another. And Jesus looks at this man and he says, all right, you've got it all figured out except one thing. Go sell all that you possess, give your money to the poor, and come follow me. Now, unfortunately, this text has been used so often to say, see, this is what a Christian life should look. You guys are such hypocrites, right? If you were really following Jesus, then you would sell all you possess, give your money to the poor, and follow Jesus. I've, I've heard that directly. Maybe it's more toward pastors. If you were, if you were really a, a, an honest pastor, right? Chris is going, but you see that we're doing the same thing the rich young man does. He's looking to the law to bring life. He's looking for following what rule, what set of rules do I need to make sure I'm keeping track of? What, what T do I need to cross? What I do I need to dot to make sure I've got this all good to go? And Jesus exposes, at least for this young man, what is getting in the way of the one thing he lacks. You see, he, he didn't lack riches, right? right? Ample riches, ample things, ample securities of this world that really are no securities, right? The grass withers, the flower fades, right? Uh, we learned one thing, at, you know, in the, in the conference this year that at, at, uh, in Ohio, one of the preachers, she talked about how Isaiah 40 talks about, you know, all the nations of the world are but dust, right? Think about that for a minute. All the things we value and hold fast and pledge allegiances to, and, and, and according to the word of God, all that will one day not exist. And all the things we hold so tight to, right, will become dust in our Or I, I think of jello more. You know how hard it is to hold jello tightly? Yeah. I think it's almost impossible. Even the really good stuff. Even Knox blocks. You ever remember Knox blocks? <laughs> was, anyway. Um, I prayed about rabbit trails today, so I'm okay. Um, but all those things we put our trust and security, and we've talked about this before. This has been a year that has exposed a lot of those things we were putting our trust and security in, right? Yeah. The government, healthcare system, finances, politics, uh, peace, the world kind of the world expects. And all that kind of got blown out of the water and exposed for what it is, idols. Yeah. A distraction from the one who we can put our trust in, and that's Jesus. And that's what he's trying to, to talk to this and show this man whom he loves. He's not trying to add a new law and say, well, you just needed one more thing. Get rid of all your stuff, and then you'll be good enough. No, the point Jesus is trying to get to is to this rich young man, like he did with all his disciples, was follow me. What I want more than anything for you, what will lead you to eternal life is this. Follow me. Trust me. Come with me. And he recognized the stuff that would get in the way of it for this young man. He recognized that for this young man, the riches were what he was holding on to. And, and Jesus is saying, but I, hold on to me. Let go of the stuff in your hands and let me take hold of you and come and follow me. You see, the one thing this young man lacked wasn't poverty. That wasn't the goal of this text. So that in order, you know, one new law, become poor, then you got it, then you're made. Because that could have easily happened, right? He could say, okay, I'll get rid of it all. Now I got eternal life and walk his own way. But the point from Jesus was, I want you to be with me. It's the point he made with the disciples earlier on in the Gospel of Mark when he had appointed the early, the first disciples back in Mark chapter 2 or 3. And it says he, he, he brought them and he, and he said he, he called them each and he said he called them to be with him. The first thing he desired with his disciples was just to be with them. And then he would equip them and send them out and there'd be things that they would do in his power and in his name. But first and foremost, it was a relationship. And the same with this rich young man whom Jesus loved. He wanted him to be with him. Which is why I think afterwards, at these words, he was sad and went away grieving for he owned much property. And I believe Jesus was grieving too. I think Jesus grieves always when he sees other things, lesser gods, lesser gospels, lesser treasure, the glitter and the shiny stuff, right? Get in the way of the kingdom, of eternity. In Jesus' prayer in John 17, Jesus prays this to the Father. He says, Father, 
Eternal life is this, to know you, the one true God, and to know the one whom you've sent, Jesus Christ. You see, what the one rich, one thing the rich young man lacked was that relationship. And it wasn't because Jesus wasn't offering it. It was because the rich young man trusted in another. And I wonder for myself and, I, and for all of us today, what is it that we seem to have a hard time getting our fingers pried off of? I might have shared this before, but I, I, uh, on my 40th birthday, I got to go skydiving with a friend of mine. And uh, it was a tandem dive, so it was great. I didn't have to do anything except get strapped into the guy who knew what he was doing and enjoy the ride, which that's a whole sermon in itself, right? <laughs> I mean, the only thing he said at the end is pick up your feet. When we're ready to land, just pick them up. So, but otherwise, enjoy the view. And he would tap me when it was time, and he'd let me even pull the cord when it was time. But I didn't have to figure it out. I didn't have to. Anyway, my friend, who was along that I was attached to also uh, used to film people. That's another thing he did during skydiving season was he would film people. You know, he had the camera on his helmet. He, was, he would film people going out. And he talked about the, one of the, the most fun dives he had one time because he always follows the people out that are jumping to film them. And they had, he's filming the persons that are getting ready to, to, you know, fall out of the plane. That's what you really do. You find this. And they said, white knuckled, hanging on to the door of the plane. And the instructor is even trying to push them out the door. And they finally do. And then they fall. They had a great dive. But I think, how, how often am I like that? Right. Right? I know that's the right thing. I know I want to do this. But, man, everything inside of me, my old nature, is kind of resisting the push. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank God the Holy Spirit is sometimes the push that gets us out to enjoy a life that we couldn't do by ourselves. And all the riches this young man had, all the stuff we rely on that can't really bring us the life that God, the good God, the one good God has for us. Which is why I'm so thankful that we do celebrate communion here every week. It's that visible, simple, tangible reminder of the one and only God who is good enough to save us. You see, his is the only riches, and his is the only treasure that can change a person's life. His is the only treasure that really can take hold of no matter what kind of heart. Even like we prayed this morning for the persecutor's heart and transform a life, just like he did with Saul to Paul, and just like he's done with every one of us at some point in our lives, taken us from darkness and brought us into his marvelous light. And so this morning, I just invite you as, 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 as part of your kind of prayer as you come forward in a few moments for Communions. Lord, what, what do I need to let fall from my fingers as I receive again the body and blood of Jesus where life is found? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness. I'm so glad that you are. Your goodness is so much greater and more imaginative than ours could ever be. And that your good work has achieved once and for all our salvation. And Lord, do bring us to your table again this morning. None of us are here by accident. You, you've drawn us. You've, you've rolled us out of bed. You got us into this place this morning to receive, again, your word and, and fellowship with you and time at your table again to be reminded of the great price that has been paid for our lives. As we eat and drink again this morning, Lord, fill us again, please, with your spirit. As we watch those things fall from our hands, Lord, may we remember the hands that were nailed to the cross for us, that purchased for us our salvation, and purchased us for us a treasure that we get to share with others. Thank you again for your precious promises fulfilled in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me as we continue our worship by singing, This is my Father's World. Number 554.
as we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Again, Father God, we give you all thanks and all praise that you are the good Father in heaven who so loved this world that you gave your only Son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And Father, I thank you again this morning for the simple and significant gift that you have bestowed on us. Not something we earn or merit, but something that you gladly and willingly give to those who put their faith in you. Strengthen us again in our confidence in your goodness. Heal those places in us that have caused us to question or doubt or be discouraged. Reveal to us once again, Lord, in, in your word and in the supper, your willingness to lay down your life. To remind us, as it says in your word, that we know what love looks like. It looks like a life laid down for the sake of another. Father God, as we pray for the nations of our world, nations, as your word says, that are but dust in the scales, but for this season and for this time, nations who have risen to power, we pray against arrogance, and we pray against sword rattling, and we pray against all that would corrupt. We pray instead, Lord, for your, your word to prevail and transform lives. We lift leaders to you, Lord God, to, to seek wisdom from you. That even in, in this in-between time, Lord God, that they can be faithful to you and, and rule well. Lord, we pray for our nation, Lord God, as you've placed us in this world for this, a time such as this as well. And we pray, Lord, that we would be faithful to you. Our allegiance is directed to you. That we would let loose from our hands anything else that we cling to, Lord, and, and take hold of the hand that reaches out to us, your hand, Jesus trust in where you are leading us, Lord. Help us not to trust in any other thing, any other scheme, but only the divine conspiracy of your love toward us that comes through Jesus. Father God, we pray for, pray for the ministry partnerships that we enjoy here at Peace Lutheran Church. And this month we raise before you Good Samaritan Rehab Center here. And we pray, Lord, for the, all those who minister to those in recovery of whatever kind of addiction or, or bondage. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to bring about radical transformations of life in each of those men and women who are part of that ministry. And we pray, Lord, today, too, that we would, we would trust and believe you to do that even in our own lives. Because you are a God who loves to do a new thing and do an amazing thing and to, to bring about life where we think there is only death. Father God, thank you too that we can come to your throne of grace with boldness, with confidence to receive grace and mercy in our time of need. And we pray for those in our midst who are in need of comfort and encouragement, healing and hope. We lift before you today Gail Schumacher, Betty Nolanson, Les Policy, Bernita Carlson, Dave Pollard, Margie Hill. Earl Carlisle, Earl Carlisle, Maggie Carlisle, Maggie Carlisle Andy, Andrews, Andy Andrews, Kristen Gorman, Kristen Gorman Karen Woods, Karen Ivan Pliaev, all those frontline healthcare workers that are in the hospitals and clinics in our community. And Father, that we can continue to trust in you and your work, that we would answer your invitation again this morning, Lord, to come and follow you. For into your hands we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
peace of the Lord be with you. Take some time to share that peace with one another. ourselves, our time, our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them into your hands for the sake of him who loved us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The night of his betrayal, our Lord took bread. He broke it as he blessed it, and then he said, My body broken for you is what this means. Remember now, my children, what you have seen. And then he took the chalice and raised it high. My blood is poured out for you, a full supply, a covenant of promise, a cleansing stream. Remember now, my children, what you have seen. We share this food together, remembering Christ. We share a common treasure and know the price. We share it without measure, a gift of love. We share our life forever with God above. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. 